Chapter 6. Wilfred was scribbling in his diary. It happened three orbits ago. On a gloomy evening, within the confines of a narrow side street adjacent to one of the colossal monorail terminals. She stood near a portal in the brickwork, beneath a feeble street lamp that cast scarcely any illumination. A youthful countenance, heavily coated in paint, drew my attention. It was the paint that intrigued me, the mask-like whiteness and the vivid crimson lips. Party adherents refrained from such facial adornments, and the street lay deserted, devoid of intrusive telescreens. For an instant the narrative grew arduous. Wilfred closed his eyes, pressing his fingers against them in an attempt to expel the recurring vision. A nearly irresistible temptation surged within him to bellow a cascade of profanities at the pinnacle of his lungs or to collide his head against the wall, overturn the table and catapult the ink pot through the window. He ruminated on the irony that one's most formidable adversary was one's own nervous system. The internal tension could manifest itself at any moment, morphing into visible symptoms. The recollection of a man he encountered weeks prior surfaced, a commonplace party member, aged between 35 and 40, of moderate height and slender build, carrying a briefcase. They passed each other with mere meters between them when a spasm contorted the left side of the man's face. It recurred as they crossed paths, a twitch, swift as a camera shutter click, yet evidently habitual. Wilfred mused, what alarmed him was the possibility that the action was unconscious. The gravest peril lay in talking in one's sleep, a vulnerability seemingly impossible to safeguard against. He took a breath and continued transcribing. I followed her through the entrance, traversing a rear courtyard into a subterranean kitchen. A bed stood against the wall, and a lamp on the table emitted a dim glow. She... His teeth clenched, and the desire to spit welled up. Concurrently, the woman in the underground kitchen brought forth thoughts of Catherine, his spouse. Wilfred was wed, had been wed at least. Presumably, his wife still breathed. The warm, stuffy odor of the basement kitchen lingered in his recollections, an aroma compounded of insects, soiled garments, and nefarious cheap fragrance, yet strangely alluring because no party woman ever adorned herself with scent. Only the proles indulged in such luxuries. In his mind, the scent was inexorably entwined with illicit liaisons. The encounter with that woman marked his initial transgression in nearly two years. Consorts with prostitutes were forbidden, but the rule could be sporadically violated. It was perilous, yet not a life or death transgression. Association with a prostitute might incur five years in a forced labor camp, but no more if unaccompanied by additional offenses. Avoiding detection during the act was the sole challenge. Impoverished districts teemed with women willing to sell themselves, some even attainable for a bottle of gin, the forbidden elixir of the proles. Implicitly, the party seemed inclined to tolerate prostitution, viewing it as a vent for instincts that could not be entirely suppressed. Mere debauchery held little consequence, provided it remained furtive, joyless, and entailed only women of a submerged and scorned class. The unforgivable crime was promiscuity among party members. Although accused during the grand purges often confessed to such crimes, it was challenging to envision them occurring in reality. The party's objective extended beyond preventing the formation of loyalties beyond its control. Its latent purpose was to eradicate all pleasure from the sexual act. Eroticism, rather than love, was the adversary inside and outside matrimony. Marriage between party members required committee approval and permission was perpetually denied if the couple exhibited signs of physical attraction. The sole recognized purpose of matrimony was procreation for the party's service. Sexual intercourse was to be perceived as a slightly distasteful minor procedure akin to an enema. This principle remained implicit but was subtly ingrained in every party member from childhood onward. 
Organizations like the Junior Anti-Sex League advocated complete celibacy for both sexes. All offspring were to be conceived via artificial insemination, new speak abbreviated as artsem, and reared in public institutions. Although this notion was not entirely serious, it aligned with the party's overarching ideology. The party aimed to suppress the sex instinct, or if suppression failed, to distort and tarnish it. Wilfred acknowledged that he could not fathom why this was the case, but it felt inherently true. Regarding women, the party's efforts had largely succeeded. Catherine re-entered his thoughts. Nearly eleven years had elapsed since their parting. Curiously, thoughts of her seldom occupied his mind for prolonged periods. He could forget his marital status for days at a stretch. Their union endured for merely fifteen months. A divorce was forbidden, but separation was encouraged in childless marriages. Catherine, tall and fair-haired with regal movements, possessed a visage that might be deemed noble until one realized the vacuity behind it. Early in their union, Wilfred concluded, perhaps from intimate familiarity, that she harbored the most idiotic, vulgar, and empty mind he had ever encountered. Not a single thought in her head transcended the level of a slogan, and she was capable of swallowing any imbecility if endorsed by the party. In his private musings, he dubbed her the human soundtrack. Living with her might have been endurable if not for one thing, sex. The moment he touched her, she seemed to flinch and stiffen. Embracing her resembled clasping a jointed wooden effigy. Strangely, even in her embrace, he sensed a simultaneous effort to repel him with all her might. The rigidity of her muscles conveyed that impression. She would lie there with closed eyes, neither resisting nor cooperating, but submitting. It was extraordinarily awkward, and after a while, horrifying. Strangely enough, it was Catherine who rejected celibacy. They must, she insisted, produce a child. Thus, the ritual continued weekly, a predictability that bordered on inevitability. She would even remind him of it in the morning, treating it as a task to be completed that evening. She had two names for it. One was making a baby, and the other was our duty to the party. Yes, she had genuinely used that phrase. Soon, she acquiesced to abandon attempts, and shortly thereafter, they parted ways. A barely audible sigh escaped Wilfred. He resumed writing. She flung herself onto the bed and immediately, without any form of preamble, executed the most coarse, repugnant action imaginable, lifting her skirt. He envisioned himself standing in the dim lamplight, engulfed in the fragrance of insects and inexpensive perfume, and within, a sense of defeat and resentment entwined with the image of Catherine's frozen, hypnotized body, eternally subjected to the party's influence. Why did it have to be this way every time? Why couldn't he have a woman of his own instead of these sordid encounters? Yet a genuine love affair was an almost inconceivable occurrence. The women of the party were indistinguishable. Chastity ran as deep in them as party loyalty. Through meticulous early conditioning, games, cold water, indoctrination at school, and participation in the spies and youth league, the natural inclinations had been purged from their essence. Reason acknowledged the likelihood of exceptions, but the heart remained unconvinced. They were all impregnable, as the party intended. More than being loved, what Wilfred desired was to dismantle that bastion of virtue, if only once in his life. The sexual act, if accomplished successfully, was an act of rebellion. Desire equated to thought crime, even arousing Catherine, if achievable, would have been akin to seduction, despite her being his spouse. Nevertheless, the remainder of the story demanded documentation. He wrote, I intensified the lamp's glow. When I beheld her in the light, after the darkness, the feeble radiance of the paraffin lamp appeared exceptionally bright. For the first time, he could scrutinize the woman adequately, taking a step toward her and then hesitating, torn between lust and terror. 
a stark awareness of the peril he undertook in venturing here. It was entirely conceivable that the patrols might apprehend him on the way out. They could even be stationed outside the door at this very moment, departing without fulfilling what he had come to do. It had to be documented, confessed. What he discerned under the lamplight was that the woman was elderly. The paint coated her face so thickly that it seemed on the verge of cracking like a cardboard mask. Streaks of white threaded through her hair, but the truly horrific detail was the slight parting of her mouth, unveiling nothing but an abyssal darkness. She had no teeth whatsoever. He wrote hastily, the scrawling handwriting betraying urgency. When I saw her in the light, she was indeed an elderly woman, at least fifty years old. Nevertheless, I proceeded and did it nonetheless. He pressed his fingers against his eyelids once again. The confession, penned at last, wrought no transformation. The therapeutic release proved ineffective. The compulsion to scream obscenities at the top of his lungs persisted unabated. Wilfred took a moment to collect his thoughts, the lingering discomfort of the confession gnawing at him. He resumed the account of that clandestine encounter. The lamplight flickered, casting a spectral glow on the squalid surroundings. The risk of exposure loomed, amplifying the sense of trepidation. Yet, the narrative had to unfold. She sprawled on the bed, the coarse fabric crinkling beneath her, devoid of any preliminary gestures, in the most brutish, repugnant manner imaginable, hoisting her skirt. I, Wilfred grappled with the memory, a fusion of desire, defeat, and resentment. The pungent odor of bugs and the lingering scent of cheap perfume seemed to permeate the very air. In his heart, the indelible image of Catherine's motionless form, ensnared eternally by the party's hypnotic influence, intertwined with the present recollection. The perennial question echoed in his mind, why this unending cycle? Why couldn't he have a genuine connection instead of these intermittent, sordid entanglements? The absurdity of genuine love affairs seemed inconceivable in the world of party women. Chastity and loyalty were inscribed in their very being through meticulous conditioning, games, icy showers, relentless indoctrination in schools, and immersion in the spies and youth league. Although reason acknowledged the possibility of exceptions, the heart remained skeptical. They were all impervious, exactly as the party desired. Wilfred's longing surpassed mere affection. It aimed to breach that fortress of virtue, if only for a fleeting moment. The successful consummation of the sexual act became an act of rebellion, as desire itself became thought crime. Even arousing Catherine, had it been achievable, would have been tantamount to sedition, despite her being his spouse. Yet, the narrative had to progress. Wilfred continued his account. I heightened the lamp's luminosity. Emerging from the darkness, the feeble radiance of the paraffin lamp assumed an almost blinding intensity. The awareness of the danger he courted in this clandestine visit gnawed at him. The patrols could apprehend him on the way out. They might be lurking outside the door at this very moment. Departing without fulfilling his purpose, it had to be recorded, confessed. What materialized under the lamplight was the stark reality that the woman was no ingenue. The layers of paint on her face resembling a cracking cardboard mask concealed the marks of time. Streaks of white traversed her hair, uh, but the truly grotesque detail was the parting of her mouth, unveiling a cavernous blackness. In a flurry of scribbles, he chronicled the revelation. Wilfred sought a reprieve from the memories. The act of committing the confession to paper had not exercised the relentless urge to unleash a torrent of obscenities. The therapeutic endeavor remained as ineffectual as ever. Winston looked down at the small crumpled page, the words staring back at him like accusing eyes. He felt a mix of relief and unease, as if he had unleashed something he could never fully control. 
the act of writing seemed to peel away layers of pretense, exposing the raw truth he had kept buried within. The image of the old woman with the thick paint and toothless mouth lingered in his mind. He couldn't shake the feeling of horror at the revelation. It was not just the dissonance between expectation and reality, but the stark reminder of the passage of time. His own mortality stared back at him through the words he had written. The forbidden encounter, the moment of rebellion, now appeared tainted and grotesque. The desire to break the walls of virtue had led him to a confrontation with the harsh truth of existence. He sighed, realizing that even in his attempts at rebellion, he was confined by the inescapable boundaries set by the party. With a heavy heart, he continued writing. The realization struck me like a blow. The illusion of youthful allure shattered in the harsh light of reality. The painted mask concealed not just the wrinkles of time, but the inevitable decay that awaited us all. It was a jarring confrontation with the transience of pleasure, a reminder that even in moments of defiance, the party's grip on truth prevailed. As I stood there, the weight of my own mortality bore down on me. The act I had deemed an act of rebellion turned into a pitiful dance with the inevitable. The illusion of breaking free, if only for a moment, crumbled in the face of the unyielding passage of time. Wilfred paused, his pen hovering over the paper. The blank space seemed to mock him, a canvas for truths he dared not confront. The room felt colder, the air heavier, laden with the weight of confessions. The room felt oppressive, as if the walls themselves were closing in on his revelations. His mind grappled with the paradox of liberation and captivity, a dance between defiance and the unrelenting forces that sought to shape his every thought. He began to write, the words flowing with a reluctant honesty. In that dimly lit room, with the scent of cheap perfume and the shadows of regret, I confronted the harsh reality of my own desires. The old woman, a relic of forgotten years, mirrored back to me the inevitability of decay. Yet in my desperate attempt to defy the party's control, I pressed on. The encounter, though tainted by the revelation of age, held a peculiar significance. It was a microcosm of my struggle, caught between the longing for freedom and the inescapable chains of conformity. The room became a theater of contradictions, where rebellion and surrender coexisted in a fragile balance. As I touched the contours of her weathered face, I couldn't escape the irony. The same hand that sought defiance found itself entangled in the strands of time, grasping not the illusion of youth, but the cold reality of mortality. It was a bitter pill to swallow, the knowledge that even in rebellion, I was bound by the very forces I sought to oppose. Wilfred sighed, the weight of the admission settling on his shoulders. The ink on the page seemed to echo the inescapability of his circumstances. He wondered if, in unveiling his innermost thoughts, he had ventured into a realm where truth and rebellion were elusive phantoms. Wilfred stared at the words he had just penned, contemplating the web of contradictions that defined his existence. The act of rebellion, so fervently pursued, had morphed into a bizarre dance with the remnants of time and the echoes of a bygone era. The room, once a backdrop for clandestine acts of defiance, now felt like a confessional for a soul caught in the crossfire of opposing forces. He mused on the absurdity of his situation, the quest for autonomy entwined with the harsh reality of a society intent on erasing individuality. The ink on the paper bore witness to his internal struggle, each word a testament to the futile resistance against the omnipresent party. Yet, even in the face of defeat, there lingered a spark of defiance, a refusal to surrender entirely to the dictates of an oppressive regime. 
With a wry smile, Wilfred continued. The old woman, oblivious to the turmoil within me, continued with a mechanical indifference. In that moment, I realized the profound loneliness that permeated every act of rebellion. The struggle, though personal, was an isolated battle in a world where camaraderie and genuine connection were scarce commodities. As I left the dimly lit room, the weight of the encounter lingered. The paradox of freedom weighed heavily on my mind, a riddle with no clear solution. The party's grip tightened, yet the flame of resistance flickered stubbornly, refusing to be extinguished. Wilfred paused, the pen poised for the final strokes that would conclude this chapter of clandestine confessions. The words, like silent echoes in the chamber of his thoughts, awaited their place on the canvas of rebellion. The air in the room hung heavy with the scent of uncertainty, the enigma of his own existence, a pawn in a game where the rules were ever-changing and the boundaries of reality blurred into a surreal tapestry. He pondered the absurdity of resistance in a world where the very act of defiance was woven into the fabric of control. As I stepped back into the obscurity of the narrow side street, the shadows seemed to dance with silent laughter. The encounter with the aged woman, a relic of the past, underscored the transient nature of rebellion. Each act, no matter how potent in the moment, dissipated into the vast expanse of conformity. The dry humour of the situation struck me. The irony of seeking liberation while tethered to the chains of my own contradictions. It was a comedy scripted by a cosmic jester with a penchant for the absurd. I chuckled at the cosmic joke, for in that moment of levity I glimpsed the absurd beauty of my futile resistance. Wilfred considered the quixotic nature of his quest. The stage was set, the actors in place, yet the narrative unfolded in a script not entirely of his making. The laughter muffled by the weight of reality, reverberated in the corridors of his mind. With a resigned grin, he concluded, and so the dance with destiny continued, a tango with time. The ink, like the indelible marks of fate, etched one more chapter into the narrative of a life entangled in the comedy of unyielding resistance. <laughs>